Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Fronteras, a changing America. I'm Johnny Coker. Today, we're gonna to be discussing the US Border Patrol and allegations of sexual misconduct and discrimination within the agency. There were 186 of these alleged incidents between 2000 and 2022, according to the Customs and Border Patrol information obtained by Aaron Siegel McIntyre. Amongst her many titles, Aaron is a seasoned award-winning investigative journalist whose work has appeared on krwg.org, as well as the New York Times, The Atlantic, and most recently, Mother Jones, where you can read her article, Crossing the Line, that gives an in-depth view of these allegations committed by or perpetrated against Border Patrol agents. Aaron, thanks so much for being with us here today. Thanks so much for having me on, Johnny. Of course. So for viewers and listeners who might not know or be familiar with your work, um, tell us about your experience covering stories at the U.S.-Mexico border, because I know you have quite the uh, resume in terms of coverage down there, especially being based out of Tijuana for some time. Thank you, Johnny. Yeah, it, it definitely does feel like a full circle moment to be here talking to you on the Fronteras desk. Um, over a decade ago, I, I was a temp staffer over at KPBS on their Fronteras desk as part of the collaboration. Um, I have covered the border and border issues for over a decade. Um, most of that time was based in Tijuana, Mexico, as you said. Um, I've also worked at Univision in Miami on their documentary unit, and I've covered the Border Patrol on and off for a good many years, both as a sort of daily news reporter um, covering events as they happened, um, and in long form with a more narrative investigative treatment, um, such as my my latest piece with Mother Jones. Mm -hmm. And and you talk about that long form piece. How how long? ago did you start this investigation into the Border Patrol in terms of uh, getting these record requests in and in terms of looking into these sexual assault allegations? When did that whole process start? Yeah, that's a great question, Johnny. So filing federal Freedom of Information Act requests, FOIA requests, it's an exercise in patience. Um, it can also generally be an exercise in frustration. So I, I've been working on a bigger project on the Border Patrol, looking at the culture of the institution and the agency um, since about 2014. It's been a slow burn of a project, I'll say. Um, this particular FOIA request, um, the one that is referenced in this magazine piece, was filed back in 2020. And, you know, it takes the agency a while to respond to any FOIA requests. Um, this was one of a bigger batch of requests. And so, you know, when you think about a federal FOIA request, there is law that governs how government agencies are tasked with responding. There are guidelines and there are laws that they have to adhere to. And so what happens from time to time, and especially when dealing with an agency like CBP, the parent agency of the Border Patrol, is that requests can be filed by media and then they just sit there stagnant and nothing happens, which in like often times for folks that are working on quicker turnaround pieces, that means the information might not be usable when it's finally obtained, right? It's taken too long. And so one, one avenue of recourse we have as journalists is to file lawsuits, um, to file FOIA lawsuits. And so I, I did so. I, I have two current cases of litigation against the federal government corresponding to FOIA requests and CBP. Um, this one FOIA set of information was released to me um, in an incomplete form. When I reviewed the data initially, I could tell based on my years of research that there were incidents that were clearly missing, including some really high profile incidents. And so I pushed back and asked them to review and revise the request. CBP responded by sending an additional two pages of information, which did include locations, which I think is key to this data set. 
That's what's different. Usually they redact that information, which makes it almost impossible to track down what happened and why. Having location data is really key. Mm. So that matters here. And, and in terms of those FOIA requests, you talk about there being some incomplete information um, in the article you talked about, you found this information through other documents. Do you think that some of the documentation that was sent to you by the U.S. Border Patrol um, was incomplete? Was that on purpose? Was it due to incompetence? Is there something else going on there? What, what do you feel? Johnny, that's the million dollar question. And when it comes to FOIA requests and CBP, it's frankly really hard to tell. I mean, the agency, I think it's fair to say they are masters at sort of evading the release of information, sort of giving reporters the runaround. I mean, this this happened 10 years ago and it still happens today when a reporter oftentimes requests a ride along or to shadow agents at work. Instead, they're paired with a public affairs official, PR specialist, and they're sort of given what the Border Patrol calls a dog and pony show. In some cases, that's literally what they show you. I remember, gosh, a long time ago, I did a very simple piece on the use of the horse patrol in the San Diego sector and asked to go out and do a ride along. And instead of actually being able to witness what agents were doing and document, you know, a day in the life, very simple kind of premise here, they literally put on a dog and pony show, took me out, set up the scene just so I could witness it. it nothing about it was real. And so when we think about how does the Border Patrol and CBP handle media requests and information, including FOIA requests, it's really hard to tell. There have been GAO, Government Accountability Office, report after report that do look at how information is handled inside CBP and how their computer systems work and don't work. For example, how the input of, let's say, misconduct allegations is entered into the computer, the completeness and thoroughness of that information. And from what that, those reviews and that information shows is that it's pretty scattershot. So it's incredibly hard to tell whether an incomplete seeming data set is negligence, is it clerical errors, or is it actually intentional on the part of the government? Are they trying to hide something? Those questions are part of what my research is trying to address and answer. Mm. And, and that's something else that you referenced in your article is that um, the, corrup the corruption within the U.S. Border Patrol is, I would say, at least based on your writing, at a higher level than many other federal and even local agencies. Um, so how do you think that plays into, you know, interview requests and FOIAs and, and getting into contact with the Border Patrol? I mean, it seems like it's been like pulling teeth a little bit. So, you know, what's your takeaway from that? How do you feel that you've been treated by the Border Patrol in your own investigations? It's also a, a great question. So, again, we kind of got to look at the context here. Um, I, I feel like the Border Patrol and CBP has treated me as a reporter quite fairly. They treat me like any other reporter. That said, they still are very difficult to work with because they are so opaque. So, for example, in this piece that I just wrote, the narrative through line looks at one case of a reported rape that took place in New Mexico, in Artesia, at the Border Patrol Academy, and this was back in 2019, so it's fairly recent. So, for this case, there are a number of officials involved. Um, there are a number, number of different agencies that knew about what happened. When I went to CBP and the Border Patrol and asked to do an interview with many of the people involved, from the alleged perpetrator to the supervisor at the time, to up, up the ranks, up to the commissioner, they provided literally no one. I couldn't talk to a single agent that the agency would let speak to media. Instead, they provide statements on background, which is generally what they do to the media. But on the flip side of that, Johnny, I will say there, there is something to be said for simply calling agents. By policy, they're not allowed to talk to press, right? Which makes our job hard. You might have a situation in which there are five agents that witness something newsworthy, and you're trying to figure out what happened and how best to report it. 
None of those agents are authorized to talk to the press. They have to go to their supervisors who then go up the chain to get permission. Um, that permission is generally not given um, simply because there's reputation to protect on the government side. If we look at their perspective, the Border Patrol has long struggled with accountability issues. And unfortunately, that's part of their brand. You know, that's something that affects agent morale. It's it's tough to be an agent today. Let's be really straight about that. And it's not all bad, but there are some pressing issues that deserve public attention. And I think in my role as a journalist, I mean, that that's important for us to come in and then help sort of guide the agency towards being more transparent. Because at the end of the day, Johnny, I mean, it's our policymakers and the American public that guide how our policy is made, that guide who gets elected and who gets to make those calls. And without having a clear understanding of, hey, what problems are occurring within the Border Patrol and outside of the Border Patrol, without knowing that, it's next to impossible to make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. And Aaron, you know, in, in your article for Mother Jones, you detail the agency's beginnings in 1924, um, having a lack of, you know, oversight and a lot of autonomy, um, how that has emboldened bad behavior. How much do you think that culture has been, has made it throughout the years all the way up to our modern era in terms of, you know, this lack of accountability, essentially? Sure, sure. So the Border Patrol's beginnings, I, I do think it's fair to say their original sort of brand, if you will, you know, it does persevere in certain ways today. And I, I think we see that in workplace culture. I think we see that in how they do handle, you know, even requests from elected officials at the congressional level to supply information. The Border Patrol and CBP typically stonewall requests. It can be really hard to, again, get information, not just for reporters, but for elected officials. And so part of that comes from the autonomy that the agency operates with. But on the other hand, part of that also comes from them doing their best with the resources they have to execute what is essentially mission impossible, right? The agency's mission today is pretty different from what it was when they first were created way back in, in the 1920s. And that mission today also was tweaked back in 2003 after the creation of the Department of Homeland Security when the Border Patrol, for all intents and purposes, went, underwent sort of a type of professionalization and a reorganization under the DHS umbrella. With that change came a focus on national security and their mission became tweaked and it became about securing the nation's borders, which up until 2003 wasn't something we tried very hard to do because it's quite literally impossible to secure our border. It's just not going to happen. And so, you know, agents have always done their best with the resources they have. They've had to sort of, you know, improvise, let's say, at times. And so part of the autonomy and part of the problem when it comes to, I think, oversight is that, you know, discipline happens in large part sector by sector. It happens at a low level based on stations and sectors agents work within. Each station and sector has their own workplace culture. They're known for different things. They encounter different problems and handle them a little bit differently. While there is federal guidance and policies that govern how, you know, for example, misconduct is supposed to be handled, it ends up being a mixed bag, I think, when you look at what actually happens at the end of the day hmm. in any given case. Certainly. And, you know, in this article, you, you already brought up the story of Violet, who was allegedly raped uh, at a facility uh, in Artesia, New Mexico. And also you spoke with um, Tina Lopez, who was one of the very first, um, well, was supposed to be one of the first women graduated into the Border Patrol back in 1975, but she was assaulted and uh, subsequently not allowed to graduate. Do you think, how, how much do those stories mirror each other? And do you think that is indicative of a lack of progress in terms of that workplace culture that you're talking about? Sure. So 
while those two stories do contain some pretty strong parallels, you know, we have to keep in mind they happened many years apart, right? We're talking a span of 50 years. So Ernestine Lopez, Tina Lopez, today she's 86 years old. And she was one of the six women who were first permitted to work as Border Patrol agents. And this is back in 1975. Um, Tina was the only Latina amongst that first class of women. And she also reported a sexual assault that happened at the training academy. Um, at the time, it was located in Los Fresnos, Texas. And she also left the academy um, shortly after reporting that alleged rape. OK, fast forward to 2019, um, you know, a similar situation unfolds with um, the woman that I call Violet in the piece. Violet's not her real name. Um, we were trying to protect her identity as well as the identity of the Border Patrol instructor who was accused of raping her. We didn't name either party. And so, you know, both cases involve, you know, a young Latina agent. Both cases involve an investigation whose results was never made known to the public. Um, both cases involve transparency issues and issues around accountability. Um, you know, when asked to comment on a number of facts that I reported out in this case, you know, CPB didn't address them and didn't engage with them. They said, hey, this is now under investigation. This is currently still under investigation. And Violet's case is five years old. It doesn't show up anywhere else. It doesn't show up in annual reports where they're supposed to tell the public how many misconduct allegations happen around what categories, if there are arrests, police involvement, that kind of thing. And they don't show up in this FOIA data set, which is supposed to represent all misconduct allegations of a sexual nature from the last 22 years. It's not mentioned. So yeah, it, it raises a lot of questions. And I think the fact that CBP can continue to not answer is, is problematic. Hmm. And, and Aaron, you've spoken in your previous work about the Border Patrol's 30 for 30 initiative, or 30 by 30 initiative that aims to get 30% of the force to female agents by 2030. Do you, how much do you feel that this lack of transparency and lack of accountability um, hinders that goal of the Border Patrol to reach that goal that they have stated themselves? Yeah, so so that's a great question, Johnny. The 30 by 30 pledge, it's part of a bigger initiative um, spearheaded by a think tank and involving many partners, both federal, local, state level, um, to bring more women into policing. So it's a big initiative. When Chris Magnus was commissioner of CBP a couple of years ago, he was the one that helped CBP sign on to this pledge. He you know, at the time publicly stated that, you know, CBP needed more female agents. The Border Patrol has always struggled to retain women. You know, today their number, the percentage of women within the ranks as uniformed agents is around five, six percent. That's really low compared to the national average of women in law enforcement, which is double that. That's around 12 percent. And so, you know, I, I can't speak for Magnus's hopes and dreams when he did sign the agency up for this pledge, which aims to bring to increase that number to 30%. That's a really high number when you think about an agency like the Border Patrol. And your question about whether accountability and transparency plays a role is a good one. But I would actually take that a step farther. Because you know, amongst candidates, amongst women in law enforcement, there are many networks I don't want to call them whisper networks, but word gets around, around what can happen, how to prepare, how to defend yourself, what you're signing up for. I mean, still today, there's a massive social media group for female agents in the Border Patrol where they can share information, share stories, vent, do that kind of thing. And, and that's really helpful. And so I think, you know, today when women sign up to become Border Patrol agents, I'd like to believe that many know the challenges they're signing up for. At the same time, I don't think many do. And so it's a mixed bag. I think the number of current female agents and their track record when it comes to retention speak volumes. 
The fact that the Border Patrol does not have any formal mechanism of doing exit interviews when a female agent leaves the agency, I mean, that's a missed opportunity, right? At the same time, I've talked to many former and current female agents who say that, hey, even if I was interviewed, you know, I'm not going to say what happened. I don't want my record to be tarred. I fear retaliation. And that's a really real risk. Mm -hmm. and, and Aaron, you've spoken with uh, former FBI assistant director and former Border Patrol chief Mark Morgan. Uh, what, what did you really take away with from that interview when it comes to talking with someone who formerly sat at the head of that organization? Did you talk about this lack of accountability and this lack of female representation within, within, the, within the Border Patrol? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I did speak to um, Morgan, who is also a former commissioner of CBP, as well as the former chief of the Border Patrol. Um, he's the only chief in the agency's history that came from a non-Border Patrol background as a former FBI agent and federal servant. Um, you know, Morgan spoke to me with a lot of candor. I, I really appreciated his time and his generosity. He, you know, talked about the challenges he felt the agency faced, both during his time in charge and after. And, you know, he seemed to think that um, more traditional ideas around gender norms played a role. He seemed to think like, he told me at one point, you know, female agents, they don't want to be hiking over mountains. If they're pregnant, what are they going to do? You know, sometimes there are cultural norms that work against us recruiting and retaining women. Women don't want to do dirty jobs which frankly, maybe that's true for some women, but that's also true for some men. I, I don't think that quite holds water as to a really comprehensive reason why the agency can't retain and recruit women. I think it's much more complicated than that. I will say I've also spoken to other former chiefs of the Border Patrol and other former commissioners as well. And I, I think, again, the problem goes back to, there is a dearth of information around this problem and I also think it's not strictly tied to gender. I think when something goes wrong, whether it's something small out on duty one night or something bigger that seems systemic and an agent tries to report, they typically can face a lot of issues in reporting and they can put their careers and their livelihoods at risk. And so A, there's environmental barriers, B, there's cultural barriers, and C, you know, the workplace of the Border Patrol, again, for better and for worse, is a culture in which this attitude of, hey, suck it up, buttercup, get to work and don't complain, that's still pervasive. And that is also a cultural barrier to talking about problems. Mm. Well, Aaron, I wanna thank you for so much for coming on the show. Unfortunately, uh, we are running out of time, but I wanna give you a chance. How can people find uh, that article that you wrote for Mother Jones, as well as your other work. Thank you, Johnny. Um, folks can follow me on X if they're still on that platform. My handle is ES McIntyre. Um, the new story will be out in the September, October print issue of the magazine Mother Jones. That hits newsstands next month. It will also be online this week. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Aaron Siegel McIntyre is an investigative journalist and an assistant professor at UNC Chapel Hill. Thanks so much for being on our program. Thank you for having me, Johnny. And KRWG has reached out to the U.S. Border Patrol requesting an interview with a spokesperson. And while we haven't received a response as of the taping of this show, that invitation remains open and we hope that we can bring you that interview soon. But that's all for today's episode. So. Remember, you can stay up to date on the latest local news at krwg.org. And of course, you can find Aaron's story in the latest Mother Jones magazine issue. For KRWG Public Media, I'm Johnny Coker, and we'll see you next time on Frontetis, a changing America.